If you have your Bible, please open it with me to Nehemiah, the book of Nehemiah. We're going to take a look at the whole book tonight, every verse. No, not quite, but we are going to look through a lot of it in a message I've entitled with a question, what will it require? We have had a rough year, year and a half, and uh, individually as families, but also a struggle as a church. Uh, but we're, we're not alone in our struggle as a church. Uh, just in the last two weeks, three different pastors of prominent sister churches in our city have resigned. And I know l- at least one of them, it was simply out of exhaustion. And I, I get it. Uh, it has been tough. And I can't imagine going through the last year and a half with any other church except Valley Baptist. Amen? Amen. This is one of the greatest churches I know of, and I'm so grateful that God has seen us through the worst of this storm. But as strong as Valley is, we have a lot of rebuilding yet to do. Now, thankfully, God has been building us back. We are seeing people come to faith in Christ every single week in the life of a church. He's already begun building us back, but there's more building to do. You know, when I think about rebuilding in the Bible, uh, the book of Nehemiah comes to mind. Nehemiah took place during the Babylonian exile. The Babylonians had invaded Jerusalem. They destroyed the city. They destroyed the temple in 586 B.C. And then in a series of waves, they captured Israelites and enslaved them. And they took them back to Babylon. And, and, And just wave after wave They left Jerusalem desolate. But God was not done with Jerusalem. And so he raised up uh, a couple leaders, a lot of leaders, in fact, to rebuild it. Ezra and Nehemiah were both contemporaries of one another. Ezra focused his attention on rebuilding the temple. Nehemiah focused his attention on rebuilding the wall around Jerusalem. And as we read it, we see that God clearly was the one orchestrating the rebuilding of the wall, the rebuilding of the temple. But it's also clear that God used his people to do it. God will be the one that rebuilds Valley Baptist and all his other churches across the globe, but he's going to use his people to do it. I promise you that. Now, the plan for tonight's message was to kick off the greatest roundup our church has ever known. We were going to begin applying more and more pressure for people to return to our gathering. But the landscape has changed just in the last week or so. Uh, We're still moving forward with all of our ministries, but we may not apply quite as much pressure. In other words, we're not going to guilt everyone quite yet. We're going to wait maybe till October to do that. Uh, The timing just isn't right with the rise of cases. We want to be careful. Um, We may delay Roundup Sunday a little bit. We don't know yet. We're just going to watch and wait, and most of all, we're going to pray for wisdom. But we're going to kick off with everything. But, but, but things have changed just a little bit. Quite a few people, even in the life of our church, uh, have come down sick. So the original plan for tonight was not for me to bring the message. It was for my dad to bring the message. But in the providence of God, that's not possible for him to do tonight. So this week, Monday morning, I went back to the drawing board. I went back to the Word. And I opened the Bible to the book of Nehemiah. And I began reading it. And I jotted down some notes as I was reading, different verses, different, different things that were jumping out uh, off the pages in my heart. And it's amazing how God used it to refresh my soul that had grown so tired, more tired than I realized. So rather than getting into some of the, what we originally planned tonight, some of the, de- the details of rebuilding, that will come. The work is, 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 lies before us. But rather than unhashing all of that, I want to change course for just a moment. I want to share from some of the notes I jot, jotted down Monday morning of how God spoke to my heart as a Christian leader, and I want to share with you the same things. So in rapid fire, I'm going to give 10 points. That's a dangerous thing for, for a Baptist preacher, but it's going to go quick. Now, I probably should have reduced that. I could have spent more time on each point. 
But I didn't want to leave any of it out. God spoke so powerfully to my heart, and I want to pass it on to you. So it will be quick. Ten-point message, uh, I don't think is, we're not going to be here all night. I'll, I'll put it that way. It's going to take Christian leadership and servanthood from God's people, His church, to see us real, rebuild stronger than we've ever been. If you're here tonight, you have influence over someone, one way or the other. And if you have influence over, over someone, you're a leader, whether you call yourself a leader or not. What is rebuilding Valley Baptist going to require? I promise it's going to require a lot. Number one, it's going to require the hand of God. But what, Actually, I'm just going to need to get to my points. I, I'll just, I'm going to preach away, but it's going to require the hand of God, all right? Um, ten points from the book of Nehemiah. Number one. We must have a burden for the needs of God's people. A God-given burden for people. When I read Nehemiah chapter 1, when we read Nehemiah chapter 1, what we will read is there are people that fled Jerusalem and they went to Babylon. And when they arrived in Babylon, Nehemiah had a question for them. And we see the question in verse, uh, well, we see the response. His question was, hey, what's it like back at home? How are the people doing? How's the city doing? And we see the response in verse 3. They said to me, the survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down. Its gates are burned with fire. So it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. When Nehemiah heard the response of his city and the condition it was in, he wept. It brought him to tears. Their response brought him to tears. He wept over the condition of his city, over the condition of the people. And that grief would not leave Nehemiah. It, it, it actually caused problems in his workplace. We read about that in chapter 2. You see, Nehemiah was a cupbearer for King Artaxerxes, which meant he needed to be happy and joyful in the king's presence. I mean, after all, he's serving the king and has all of the king's blessings that are at his disposal, but Nehemiah was not happy. We see that the king asked him in verse number 2 of chapter 2, he says, Therefore the king said to me, why is your face so sad since you're not sick? This is nothing but sorrow of heart. So I became dreadfully afraid and said to the king, may the king live forever. But why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies waste and its gates are burned with fire? Let me ask you a question. Have you ever had nothing but sorrow in your heart for what causes sorrow in the heart of God? There, there are times in my life where everything outwardly seems to be going great, where I should be soaring with, with heights of happiness, but I have great sorrow in my heart for God's people, for God's people who have strayed, for people in the church who have lost their first love of Jesus Christ, for the lostness of our city and our world. Let me ask you, when is the last time you literally wept for our city? where God moved in your heart to the point of tears, where you're praying and weeping for the lostness of the neighborhood that God has placed you in, the people that he has surrounded you with, that you're to be a bright, shining light of the gospel of Christ. When's the last time you wept over your life group who, who has not all returned? who many are, have broken uh, relationships because sin has invaded their life? We should weep over the things that cause Jesus to weep the things that break God's heart. Number two, we must humbly confess our sin and prayerfully rely upon God. You want to know what it requires? It requires confession and repentance. Any sin in our life, we must confess it. As soon as Nehemiah heard the news about Jerusalem, he wept. But then what did he do? He fasted and he prayed and he confessed. He confessed the sin of the people. I want to encourage you as members of Valley Baptist, to confess your sin every day. Every single day and throughout the day because confession is, is, is soothing to the soul. Why? 
Because our fellowship with God is broken by sin. And when we confess it, he promises to restore that fellowship. It's through confession that he does that. Now, I also don't want to glass over the fact of what we read, that he fasted. He fasted and he prayed. I believe fasting is a lost Christian discipline for many, and it should not be. Some of the most astounding uh, answers to prayer that I've ever had in my life was when I sought God through fasting and prayer to take the need before the Lord with such seriousness and reverence. If you're trying to be a Christian servant without prayerfully relying upon God, you're simply being a poser. You're being a fake. You're being a hypocrite. A prayerless Christian leader is no Christian leader because a Christian leader is leading people somewhere spiritually. And if you're not following after the God and relying upon His Spirit to lead, then you're just taking a walk and who knows where you're headed with the people. We must rely upon God in prayer. The third point is this. We must look for and take advantage of God moments. God moments. I don't know if you use that terminology, but uh, I grew up with it. This is God-orchestrated opportunities. God used Nehemiah's sorrow. He wept for his people. He wept for them, and then he was sorrowful before the king, and God presented an opportunity right in Nehemiah's lap. We read in chapter 2, verse 4, Then the king said to me, What do you request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. He went right back to prayer. The king said, what can I do for you? You're sad. What what can I do? And at that moment, Nehemiah could have had anything. He could have requested any worldly pleasure at his disposal, and he would have had it. But no, that's not what he did. He didn't even request food, uh, some better food that he could enjoy and make him happy, or a better living environment. No, no, no. Nehemiah knew this was an opportunity of a lifetime. This was a God moment. This was a God-orchestrated moment in his life, and immediately he hit, his, he hit his knees in prayer. And then he took action and told the kings his request. He said, here's my plan. Here's what God has placed on my heart. I need to go back to Jerusalem and see it rebuilt. So he made a plan to take papers with him so he'd have authority to do so. Here's the deal, folks. If we want to see God rebuild greater and and stronger than ever, then we must have our head on a swivel looking for God moments everywhere we look because God's going to present them. And when we've got to see them and we must pray and take action when we do. COVID, I personally believe, is a God moment. Now, you may think I'm crazy and I, I kind of think I'm halfway crazy saying it, but I believe it. Because the pain and suffering that the world has experienced has driven them to not have answers. People do not have answers to all of the inner turmoil that they're going through. But Jesus provides an answer. We know that. And so there's opportunities, God moment opportunities everywhere we look. We got to recognize it. We got to see it. We got to pray. And then we got to get off our hind end and get to work sharing the good news of Christ with people. Point number four, we must be sensitive to the guidance of the Holy Spirit. I don't think we talk about this enough. We must be sensitive to the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Where do I get that? Verse number 12 of chapter 2. Then I arose uh, in the night, I and a few men with me. I told no one what my God had put on my heart to do in Jerusalem. Did you notice what Nehemiah said? Who put rebuilding the wall on his heart? God placed it on his heart. I believe the Holy Spirit of God placed it on his heart. Here's the deal. I still believe God places ministry on people's hearts. I believe that's the hand of God. I still believe that God calls people into ministry. I still believe the Holy Spirit appoints pastors over churches as Scripture teaches. I still believe God is involved in this world. He didn't create the world and and, and just step away and let it tick away. No, he's intimately involved in our lives. The Holy Spirit is at work. We must be sensitive to his leadership and his guidance. The other day, someone asked me, they said, you know, I I feel like God has placed this ministry on my heart. And I, I said, well, 
that's a great idea. I, I heard the idea. I said, if God's placed it on your heart, you don't, need my, you, you don't need to wait for me to organize it for you. You're a member of Valley Baptist. You get to work. Go. If God's placed it on, if the whole, get your life group involved. See who will join you and get to work in the mission that God has placed on your heart. You see, the Holy Spirit guides us in ministry. He does primarily through his word. He does through when we ask for wisdom. Uh, James says he's going to give it to us liberally and generously. He guides us through godly counsel. Sometimes he does so through placing something on our hearts, just like he did Nehemiah. It's Holy Spirit directive. We must be sensitive to that. We must be sensitive. I believe the Holy Spirit is placing. If he's placing something on your heart, you must respond and do it. Point number five, and we'll keep moving here. We must cast a vision, constantly reminding people why we do what we do. What's the why? Chapter 2, we see that Nehemiah surveys the wall. He enters Jerusalem. He looks, man, it's in bad shape. These gates are burned down. He surveys. He takes inventory. Christian leadership surveys the landscape. What's it going to require? What, what do the people need? Where are they broken down and in what ways do they need to be built back up? In what ways do the people need to be edified and strengthened and, and reinforced? Now, once Nehemiah evaluated the condition of the wall, he would begin casting the vision to the people. But first, before you cast vision as a Christian leader, I want to encourage you to take inventory of your ministry. Nehemiah evaluated it and then he cast the vision. Where's the vision? Verse number 17, chapter 2. Then I said to them, you see the distress that we are in. That's the why. How Jerusalem lies at waste and its gates are burned with fire. Here's the vision. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a reproach. Let me take a moment here for just a moment to survey the landscape of where we're at as a church and cast just a little bit of vision for you. Many of our people are scattered. The wall's been torn down, so to speak. Now, thankfully, it's already been rebuilt a, a, a bunch, a bunch, and we praise God for that. But, we, but, but our, our people are scattered. Many of them have not come back to the gathering of the church. Many of them have fallen into dark sin. I know because I've been dealing with many of them. They're in sin. Their families are breaking. Others uh, have developed some bad habits. They're, they just don't come to church. They're just going to watch online. They're going to do this. They're, gonna, they're missing the fellowshipping and, and the assembling of gathering together. Some are still fearful. So what do we do? What's the vision? How, how do we accomplish it? Because everyone's all across the map. Here's what we do. We go after them one by one with the love of Jesus. One by one. Every single person in our church, we go with, with the most love and care possible. Every single person in your life group, every single person in your ministry, every single person that you look around where, you know, I know you guys sit and you guys have habits of where you sit. You look around, I haven't seen so-and-so. You go after them. We all go after people with the love of Jesus Christ. Every single person. Here's the deal. If they haven't returned yet, you let them know you miss them. Find out why they haven't come back and then pray for them, letting them know that we are here for them. Here's the other thing we do. We start leading people to Jesus left and right. We should always be doing that. But that, you, we got to lead people to Christ left and right. And thankfully, that's been happening in the life of their church. But we got to invest our lives in them. We must disciple them and teach them to observe all things that Jesus has commanded. We got to plug them in the lifeblood of our church into life groups. Now, we got to face the music, though. Some of our members aren't coming back. Many of them are in new church homes. I mean, it's amazing how God has done a lot of sheep swapping uh, during uh, COVID. We recognize that. We know that as pastors. There's, there's been a lot of uh, sheep swapping. But here's the deal. This is one thing I've been covered by. Jesus is the great shepherd. They're his sheep, right? So he, he, they've been redirected for all kinds of different reasons. But I believe God's going to use that. New environments, new leadership, new, new opportunities to serve. And so some folks have found new church homes. Most, most people, 
that we've lost have literally left the state of California. They've moved. So not all of our members are going to come back. All that means is we better start reaching more and more and more and more people for Jesus. That's what it's going to take. Now, point number six, we must sacrifice and work with all our heart. Rebuilding requires sacrifice. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse number 6. This is, I love this. He says, so we built the wall and the entire wall was joined together up to half its height for the people had a mind to work. The NLV says that that they worked with all of their heart. They had a mind to work. They they worked. They put their hands to use. And we must do the same. God's going to rebuild it, but he's not going to rebuild it with lazy people, lazy children. He's going to build it with people that have a mind to work. You know, this work environment, This was a hostile work environment. I guess you could put it in today's terms. Uh, Nehemiah is being criticized. The people are being criticized. But not only are they being criticized, they're actually being threatened. They're being threatened to the, the wall to be torn down. So what did they do? What did Nehemiah do with the threats? Verse number uh, 17. Those who built on the wall and those who carried burdens, that's those carrying rocks, loaded themselves so that with one hand they worked at construction and with other, the other hand they held a weapon. Can you imagine that? So they're working, they're laying the wall, but they got a weapon in the other hand because they're ready to defend the wall. Verse number 22 It says, at that same time, I also said to the people, let each man and his servant stay at night in Jerusalem and that they may be on guard by night and a working party by day. He didn't give them a day off or even a night off. So neither I, he he was the example, my brethren, my servants, nor the men of the guard who followed me took off our clothes except that everyone took them off for washing. I'm kind of, I'm sure they were glad that they got at least to take them off to wash them. They didn't smell quite, quite, quite so bad. But here's the point. These guys were committed. They're working with one hand. They're defending with another. They're working by day. They're on guard by night. This was all consuming. Their ministry was all consuming. It was the main focus of their life. Now here's the deal in the Western church at large. Many members have gotten work brittle. That's just, that, that's the fact of it. Many members have gotten work brittle. They think, oh, I'll work, I'll make a living, I'll, I'll make some money, I'll have my family time, I'll, i got to have my leisure time, i got to have that fun time. And if, once it's all said and done, if I have a little more energy after all of that, maybe I'll, I'll serve a little bit. Listen, Jesus doesn't want our leftovers, folks. He doesn't want our leftovers. He doesn't deserve our leftovers. Jesus wants our best. Christian leadership requires sacrifice and great work, hard work. It involves rolling up our sleeves in the mess of other people's lives and to pour into them. Sometimes it, it, it involves making a bunch of calls, 20, 30, 40, 50 calls maybe in one day or a bunch of coffee appointments with people as you reach out to them or lunch appointments as you invest and disciple them to follow after Jesus. It might even involve dropping everything one evening when crisis comes into a person's life and you want to be there with the love of Jesus to hold them and to cry with them whatever they're going through. Nehemiah says dedicate himself to the building of the wall for 12 years. Ministry takes hard work and great sacrifice. Point number seven, we must learn from criticism and not be discouraged by it. Nehemiah was an expert at dealing with criticism. Chapter six of Nehemiah, he receives criticism and we see his response in verse number three. He says, so I sent messengers to them saying, I'm doing a great work so that I cannot come down. He's on the wall, he's working. Why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you? But they sent me this message four times. Just know people who criticize, sometimes they're persistent. And I answered them in the same manner. Their criticism of Nehemiah could have been a distraction to Nehemiah 
But Nehemiah had set about in his mind to do that which God had placed on his heart to do, and he would not come down from the wall. And let me challenge you, folks, let us not come down from the wall. And I don't care whether you may be retired. Don't come down from the wall of ministry. God has placed each one of us at a different section on the wall, a different spot, and criticism may come our way, but let us not come down from the wall. Let us not be distracted. Sometimes criticism is legitimate. Other times it's made up. Look at verse number eight. Then I sent to them saying, no such things as you say are being done but you invent them in your own heart. For they all were trying to make us afraid, saying their hands will be weakened in the work and it will not be done. Now, therefore, O God, strengthen my hands. Folks, I want to tell you right now, expect to be criticized if you're in Christian leadership. When you reach out to people from your life group who haven't come back to church, you're going to get all kinds of responses. I promise you, you're going to get all kinds of responses. Many of them are going to be very thankful and grateful that you care enough to reach out to them. But some of them are going to criticize you. Some of them are going to criticize our pastors, your pastors. Some of them are going to criticize our church family. Let not their criticism take us down from the wall of ministry God has placed us on. When criticized, what do we do? Well, number one, we got to learn. There, so sometimes there, even in the worst of criticism, there might be something there we can learn from. Sometimes there's truth in someone's criticism. We should always seek to learn, God, what are you teaching me? What are you doing with me through this? But sometimes criticism is simply a distraction from what God has called us to do. It seems like personally when I'm busier than ever in the weightiest matters, the weightiest matters of God, is when I'm criticized the most. Every time I'm called upon to preach, that week seems like it's just, it, it, I, I don't know why. I, I think I know why. It's because I'm at work in the Father's business and others are trying to distract. Don't be discouraged by criticism. In the book of Acts, it's a, amazing how the Holy Spirit comes upon the people. And what, does the, what happens when the Holy Spirit comes upon them? They receive power, right? They receive boldness. They receive courage when the Holy Spirit, he, the Holy Spirit places courage into them. And we're also supposed to place courage into other believers. That's literally what the word encourage means, to place courage in to someone. But here's the problem. Some people aren't trying to place courage in you. They're trying to pull courage out of you. They're trying to discourage you. Never ever be discouraged by the criticism that is coming your way because of doing the Lord's work. Point number eight, we must consistently go back to the Lord in prayer. Now, you're probably saying, Pastor Andrew, you already had a point on prayer. You can only have one point on prayer. Turns out I can have more than one on prayer. I have it there intentionally again. Why? Because Nehemiah consistently went back to the Lord in prayer. At the end of verse 9, after he's been criticized, Nehemiah responds. He says, now therefore, O oh God, strengthen my hands. Kicking off your ministry in prayer is not enough. We must pray without ceasing, constantly relying upon the Lord. We must constantly go back to the Lord for his strength. Zechariah chapter 4, verse number 6 says, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. By my spirit. The times in my life when I have been the most tired are always the time I'm, times I'm busiest in ministry, not relying on his spirit. My own power, my own gift set, my own strength, my own willpower to press forward. And that will leave us restless. It will leave us burnt out. We must rely upon him. Point number nine, we must be directed by God's word. Directed by God's word. If, if I were to name, if I had to boil down to one reason I believe God's hand of blessing has been upon Valley Baptist Church, and there's a lot of them, but if I had to narrow it down, it's, it, we are directed by biblical authority. 
directed by biblical authority. In Nehemiah chapter 8, Ezra stands at the water gate on a high wooden platform and he reads and he teaches God's word from daylight till noon. That's a long church service. You guys want to be here that long tonight? With the business meeting we just had, you, you're going to be here a long time, but uh, we're going to wrap it up here soon. What did the people do when they heard the word? Read it. Nehemiah chapter 8, they worshiped. The declaration of the word of God was the worship. Oh, they sang, oh, they did all those things. But they worshiped as Ezra would open up the scriptures. You would read and the people stood to their feet out of respect. They were attentive. They couldn't be as attentive when they were sitting down. So they stood up to be attentive to the reading of God's word. Then they raised their hands while he's preaching. And they shouted, amen and amen. When they got excited about what God was doing in his word, what he was saying they bowed their faces down to the ground as, as the preaching happened and they responded to what God was saying in his word. Now, here's the deal. The old-time Baptists had a lot of things going for them, one of which I believe was they weren't afraid to get excited about God's word. Amen? 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 amen and amen. They shouted. They, they could shout in the church service. Somehow, over time, We've gotten more reserved and hesitant in our response to God's word. And I'm not sure where that came from, but I can tell you right now, it, I don't see it in Scripture. In Nehemiah chapter 8, we see an example of expository preaching. That is what we do here at Valley Baptist. Verse number 8, it says, so they read distinctly from the book. They read it in the law of God, and then they gave the sense. They gave the meaning and helped them to understand the reading. They read from Scripture, then they helped the people understand. I personally think this is the best way to do it. God's Word directed them. Now, if we were to fast forward to the end of the book of Nehemiah, we will see that they stopped relying upon God's Word. They stopped taking it seriously. They stopped paying attention to the details of His Word, and sin broke out. Sinful disregard for His Word. We must always be a people that are directed by the book. Not by the latest fad. Now here's the tenth and final point. And we will get going. I'm guessing some of you guys need to use the restroom if you uh, drank too much t iced tea or something like that. Someone raised their hand, but I'm not going to point them out. Uh, <laughs> last point. We must plan and organize. Now that doesn't sound exciting, does it? We must plan and organize, but that's what, that's what it takes. In Nehemiah chapter 12, we see the, they organized their worship center service when they dedicated the temple. People were appointed to be in charge of the offering of the tithes that were to go to the Levitical priests, to the musicians, to the gatekeepers, and no doubt many other min ministries. They had certain people that were set aside to handle the money. There were two different choirs that were organized for that great worship service to lead the people in giving thanks now, here's a side note. If you can sing, please consider joining our choir. One of the most humble and Christ-like persons I have ever had the privilege of knowing leads our choir in Charlene Neal. If God's given you a good singing voice, please use it to help people worship the Lord. But here's my point. That was a side note. The point is they were organized. Choir takes organization. Ministry takes organization. The whole book of Nehemiah is about organization in a lot of ways. It's about Nehemiah organizing the people to accomplish what God had placed on his heart. Now, one of the reasons God used Nehemiah so much was because Nehemiah understood the importance of organization. He got people on certain families. You, you take this section of the wall. You take that section of the wall. You take that gate. You take that gate. Oh, you be in the choir. When threats occurred, okay, we're going to post guards at night. He organized the people just like pastors and overseers in the New Testament are called upon to organize people and oversee ministry. God has always been a God of order and organization. Read about his instructions in Noah's Ark of the temple that was built. Or just look at creation itself and the detail of all of his creation. God is organized. But he didn't stop being organized when he came to the New Testament. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we read about how God has organized the body of Christ. That is his church. He's given each one of us different spiritual gifts to use for the edifying and building up the body. Here's the deal. 
God has given you a spiritual gift or spiritual gifts. Please use them. Please use them. Do not let them go to waste. They are there to help build up the body of Christ. Now, I need to wrap up tonight. Here's what the message is really about if I had to summarize it. Jesus is building back his church. And I truly believe in the depths of my heart that there are bright days ahead. I don't know what those bright days are going to look like. It might be bright days in the midst of darkness. Bright days for his church. The gospel is going to expand. Jesus is building his church. He's using us and tools in his hands to do it. Here's what it's going to require of us. I'm not going to list all ten. But let me summarize it with three. We've got to have a burden for people. To love people like God loves them. If we don't have a burden for people, shame on us. We get so busy about us, about me. We get so busy about, about what I need to do, about this and that. No, 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 listen. There are people everywhere that are hurting. As pastors, we can't minister to all of them. I promise you, we can't. We try, we can't. We're not designed, God didn't design it that way. We must have a burden for people. Here's the second thing, we must rely upon God. A God reliance. We do that through prayer. And the last thing, we gotta work with all our heart, tirelessly, sacrifice everything. We have to sacrifice everything for Jesus. It's all on the table, everything for him. Work with all of our might, work with all of our heart to fulfill his mission of making disciples of all the nations. Friends, let's keep our eyes on Jesus. Let's not get distracted. Let's not let anything take us down from the wall. God's doing a great work. It's hard work. It's tough. There's so many changes going on. Some of those changes are our fault as pastors. Some of them were thrust on us that we hate. There's change everywhere. It's hard work, but God is building something. He's building a people. If we'll just rely upon him to do it, find your spot on the wall. And I want to encourage you something. Invite others on that wall. It may be that some, maybe you're here tonight and, and you have not been on the wall lately. COVID got you distracted. Get back on the wall. Maybe you know people that have gotten distracted by the cares of this life and it's very easy to do, especially in the last year and a half. Invite them back on the wall. Invite them back into the ministry. And then, by the grace of God, and the power of his spirit, let's rebuild Valley Baptist to be, it's hard to imagine, it's hard to imagine, to be even a brighter, shining light in the midst of a dark and dying world. I want to close with a word of prayer, and then we're going to, Pastor Brian's going to come up. Father, Help us, Lord Jesus. Place on our heart, Lord, people. May your Holy Spirit lead and guide us. May you move. May you give us the strength every single day to work with all our heart for your glory. We love you. We are grateful that we are your children. But Lord, we know we're also your servants. Help us serve in the direction you've called us. By the power of your name, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.